Bueno, hola, soy Regina Nancia, soy una postdoctora del Instituto de Herbetología de Portugal en Santa Fe, Argentina, y soy una miembro de la Elite Early Career Advisory Group. Y es mi placer to welcome you to today's ECR webinar. With this webinar series, we aim to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. First, uh, a word about our host. ELIFE is a non-profit organization that is operating a platform to improve all aspects of research communication by encouraging and recognizing the most responsible behaviors in research. As I mentioned, I'm part of the Early Career Industry Group, and the ACAT role is to influence and support ELIFE work to catalyze both reform in evaluation and communication of science, and in particular to represent the needs and aspirations of researchers at early stages in their careers for a research culture that is healthy for science and for scientists. Today, uh, our webinar panel panelists will talk about leadership and mentorship in academia, and following the panelists' presentations, we will invite questions and comments from the audience. First, let me talk about the code of conduct. During the webinar, please be respectful, inclusive, appreciative, and open to learning from everyone else. Do not attack, demean, harass, or encourage others. Uh, such behavior in others. If you feel uncomfortable or unwelcome on any of these webinars, please contact eLife via email in the address that you see on the on the screen. We reserve the right to ask anyone to leave and to or to deny access to subsequent webinars. This session is being recorded and we will make it available on YouTube in the near future. If you need help, please uh, send a chat message message directly to Shaki or to me. Following the presentations, we'll be relying your question to the panelists. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, you can type your question into the Zoom chat box, Zoom chat box or you can tweet us at uh, eLife community using the hashtag ECR webinar. I will read out your name and question in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Now, I would like to welcome uh, your, our speakers. First, we have uh, Professor Kathleen, Jacqueline Monaghan, Professor Monaghan is currently the Canada Research Chair in Plant Immunology and Health Research Group in the Biology Department in Queen's University, Canada, focuses on immune signal transduction and fine-tuning mechanisms in plants. We invite you, uh, Jacqueline, to share your screen. So we can move then to uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Oye. Okay. Dr. Ay started his independent group in 2020 and as an SNF Ambition Fellow to study cross-structural secret evolution, and he's current, currently at the Department of Biology at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. So yeah, um, first of all, I want to, to thank uh, Regina and uh, Tignas and the eLife community to give me the chance to present myself and, and share my opinion, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So as uh, Regina already said, I'm a assistant professor at the moment, um, but just a few words about my career path. So I started actually my scientific career uh, in Germany, so I was doing my undergraduate studies in the University of Heidelberg before moving to uh, the Institute Curie in Paris, in France, for a PhD in developmental neuroscience. And then I joined a lab in Switzerland for my postdoc. Um, and then I, uh, one event that kind of was important during this journey was then the starting of a family in, in 2016. So this is when my first kids were born. So then uh, my family and myself decided we wanted to stay a little bit longer in, in Switzerland. And for this, I uh, was able to gain one of these Ambitione fellowships for people not in Switzerland. So this is a funding scheme that basically allows you to do a first step into independence by uh, funding your individual research for um, a time period up to four years. So during this time, I was still in the same department as where I did my postdoc, but I had the chance to hire uh, technician in a postdoc working with me. And so I had a, a small independent unit within the bigger department where I did my postdoc. And then um, end of last year, I started uh, as an independent PI position uh, as assistant professor at the University of Freiburg in, in Switzerland as well. So basically all what I will be telling you today is based on my experience mainly in Europe. So as you can see, my whole research career was in Europe. So um, I'm mostly familiar with the funding and uh, the academic landscape in, in Germany, Switzerland, and, and France, if there are specific questions about these countries. So um, 
just a few words about my group. So my group is rather small. We are just uh, three people. So there's Justine, that's my lab manager, and Enrico, that's my postdoc. So these are the people that I've been working with in the last three years. We are currently uh, recruiting um, more students, but um, I still have, like, I, I would say, a, a very junior perspective on um, on mentorship and, and leadership. So I try to give you more advice um, how you can actively seek for mentorship than how I mentor my team. Maybe Jacqueline, uh, afterwards, she will give you more details from the more senior perspective of that. So when uh, Ivan actually um, approached me and wanted uh, and, and asked me if I would be willing to talk about mentorship and leadership, I, I, uh, I first have to think and uh, reflect a little bit what, what does mentorship actually mean? So what are the different facets of mentorship? And uh, as it's a very complex topic, I try to break it down to just kind of core messages and the core uh, principles that I think that are important for you to take home from this uh, seminar. So basically, I try to distill it down in, into two points. So what I think what is really crucial if we talk about mentorship and leadership, and this is independent of an academic or an industry setting, is for you to be proactive. So uh, I think it's really crucial throughout your career stage that you try to be in the driving seat, that you are proactive, that you look for opportunities and you're actively uh, involved in, in shaping your career. And uh, in this aspect, it's also important that you nurture your network at every career stage. I will give you more details in the next slide what I mean exactly with this, but I think this is really one of the most important uh, aspects of, of mentorship and leadership. And the second, what I found uh, especially important uh, at the step from a postdoc, where you basically work with yourself and on your own project, uh, when you then start leading people, that you should to get to know yourself. Because it will be crucially important that you know what you want, how you work, to better understand how others do. So basically, what I uh, try to show you in the next slide, I think it's important that you gain this knowledge and you spend some time reflecting on yourself um, to then be able to, um, to be a, a good leader and, and interact with others. So to be, put this bit more into context for the different stages in, of an academic career, so what I uh, show you here, I just broke it down into PhD, postdoc, and junior PI as kind of the three stations that I went uh, went through. And as I said, just from the mentee perspective, so what are good mentors, what are crucial mentors that, that I was seeking throughout my career. And I think the first person that you should try to identify in your environment is a senior PI that you can connect with. So this should be a hierarchically independent person that is not your, your PI that's a direct supervisor, but rather somebody in your environment that you uh, interact with on a regular basis and that you can go to with uh, when you seek for advice. So the advantage of this person will be that um, because of the seniority, he will have an independent view on the situation and he can help you, help you at the different career stages. So just to give you an example for your, during your PhD, this might be a good person that you can go to to ask for advice, uh, which postdoc might be suitable for you. When you're a postdoc, this person might have a good perspective on what are career uh, opportunities that are out there, how to approach um, uh, the job search, and so on and so on. And then, very important that maybe sometimes we forget a bit about is the peer group that is around you. So you should, you should really culture and uh, nurture this kind of network of people that you have that are at the same career uh, uh, stage as you because they will face the same situations they will face the same challenges and they grow together with you. So um, during your PhD, this might be other PhD students in the same lab, but also PhD students that are in the same department. And what is interesting is while you will pro uh, progress in your career, also these people, they might not work in the same field, they might not work in the same country, but if you stay in an academic environment, they will pop up in different research institutes around you and you will actually uh, be able to connect to this network later on in your career stage. And this is not only limited to academia, but also for industry. Um, these people might be in an in industry position that you're interested in and help you in the future. For the postdoc, it's maybe a, a bit different because there, um, fellow postdocs in the same lab might be an important peer group then uh, within your kind of high research field because they will be the peers that uh, in the future will be you will be collaborating with when they open up their own independent research labs. So really try to be connected to this peer group and actively work on uh, connecting to others uh, around you. Then uh, during this stage of PhD postdoc and, and PI, um, of course, then you should also seek 
for opportunities to mentor other people. So what are potential mentees that are around you? And these are usually um, either students, PhDs or postdocs, depending on your own PhD, uh, on your own career stage. So you can help them and help your colleagues to basically orient them, them orientate them and, and give them career advice uh, when they come to you. And I would encourage you to actively seek out for these kind of junior people to really uh, help them in their own career development because it will also help you to reflect on, on your own path and, and what made you take uh, distinct decisions. So I think this is uh, all that I, I wanted to cover about mentorship, then just a few words about leadership. And here, I, what I think is really crucial to develop leadership skills is that you learn about project and time management. So I think this is skills that are transferable in whatever environment you work with, but they will benefit you in, in every stage if you are put in managing your own time, you will also need the skill to manage the time of others, manage the project of others, and it will always be beneficial if you try to get some training in these particular skills. And to come back to the point that I made that you could know better yourself. Um, so there are these kind of personality tests where you can, they might be a bit stereotypical, but you get an idea what kind of personality types are out there. So I found it very useful during my career in the, and mainly in the postdoc to take some leadership courses just to reflect on what personalities are there, how do, pers how do different people approach different uh, problems to understand why not everybody is working the same way as, as I do. And I think this is critical when you hire people and you start working in a team that you recognize your own weaknesses um, and you know how others might approach problems um, uh, in a different way to, to yours. So just to sum up again, what what I try to tell you is that I really think these are the two take home messages. So try to be proactive in your career development and, and get to know yourself. And with this, um, I want to thank you and happy uh, to answer questions later on. Thank you, Tom. Okay, inspiring words. So uh, we can go back to Jacqueline. I am delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I will start by just introducing myself a little bit. So I am Canadian and I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto, uh, which was a transformative experience because I really became uh, enveloped and absorbed into the research community. And I was absolutely fell in love with, with doing research at an early stage. I did my PhD at the University of British Columbia um, in Vancouver, where I really developed a love for plant microbe interactions research, and that's what I've been working on for most of my career. I then went to do a postdoc at the Sainsbury Laboratory in Norwich, England, and this was also a very transformative experience because I moved essentially out of the um, university sector and into a more, I don't, I wouldn't, a more um, institute um, situation. And the way that we do research in institutes is a lot different. And so I learned a, a whole new skill set, I think, with working, um, about working with, with, with people at different career stages and so on during that time. Uh, then I started my faculty position at Queen's University eight years ago. So I've been running a research group uh, since then. And um, I was reflecting on some of the kind of early challenges, I would say, that maybe some people in this audience would be interested in as early career researchers. I focused on challenges here that I experienced pre-tenure, but some of these are still things that I experience now, even as I'm post-tenure. Um, in Canada, when you have uh, the, the types of grants that we get, don't typically allow you to hire a um, very senior team right away. So I had a very junior team for the first few years of my group. And when I say that, I mean mostly bachelor's students and master's students. And this age group is a very um, interesting group to work with, I think, because we're talking about people who are, you know, between 18 and 22. And this is a time in your life, I think anyone can see that, where you're still trying to find yourself, you're trying to understand who you are, and you may not even know what your own career goals are just yet anyway. So that brought about a lot of challenges in, its, in itself, and notably this idea of balancing my trainee's career development with my own. Because when you're pre-tenure, you have a lot of things that you need to complete on the, the pathway to getting your permanent position, but you also do have to balance your uh, goals and aspirations with the goals and aspirations of your trainees. Um, another major challenge was not knowing what I didn't know. 
Um, what I mean by that is not understanding bureaucratic processes uh, that happen at universities. I was always very, I don't know, not involved in how decisions get made um, at universities. I was just busy doing my research and didn't pay attention to, I don't know, decisions by committees and all that kind of thing. And so that was a big learning curve to figure out um, the governance of a university. And it took a long time to understand, and I'm still learning some of those things. And of course, I think most people um, in junior stages also suffer from imposter syndrome. And that was definitely something that I still struggle with, but for sure in the earlier, in the earlier um, years. So back to this idea of having a, a very junior team or even just your first team, um, that brings me to ideas of mentorship. So, you know, I was very excited to become a mentor for all of my trainees. And one thing that I realized really early on is that being a supervisor does not mean you are a mentor. Uh, mentorship requires uh, building trust between you and your trainees. And I really like the, this analogy of a mentor as a coach. So if you think of somebody like Michael Jackson, who I've quoted, or sorry, Michael Jordan, who I've quoted here, um, he says that his best skill was that he was coachable. Okay. And if you think about someone like his famous coach, Phil Jackson, um, who would say, okay, you're not doing this part right. Uh, change the angle of your ankle so that you'll, you know, get the basket in the net. Probably what you would do is change the angle of your, your, uh, your ankle so that you could hit the, hit the ball into the net. Um, what that requires, though, is a trust. You need to trust that your coach or your mentor is giving you advice that will actually benefit you. Um, and building that trust takes a lot of time and effort and different skills. So I think one of the most important things to adopt as you are starting your own groups um, is things that will foster trust building. And one of those things, I think, is adopting a growth mindset overall. So embracing failures as opportunities, I think, is a really key a critical thing I would like people to take away. Science as an endeavor or research requires a lot of failures. It's how we figure things out. And a lot of times, especially for very young people, um, the success and self-worth is really tied closely to your, your work. And so failures can seem really, really um, important or big, and they can take kind of take over. Whereas if you really train, you know, your 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 students and your postdocs and so on to just embrace failures as part of the growth process, I think this can go a long way in building trust. It also helps to build spaces where people can be authentic. Uh, they can be themselves. That includes grumpy days. That includes great days. That includes quirks and so on. And so that they can be part of um, uh, of an inclusive environment. Another important part point that I want to make about mentorship is I think it's really important for for group leaders to be deliberate in their um, uh, access, like giving access, equal access to all of the trainees. So for by by being deliberate, I mean schedule those things into your calendar. Um, I'm not a fan of meetings for meetings' sake, but at the same time, I think if you come up with a good schedule where those meetings will be fruitful and you can come up with ways to do your agendas, and we can definitely talk about that, for example, um, afterwards, then you're making sure that you're protecting time in your calendar, at least equally for every trainee in your lab. So having the one-on-one -on -one meetings, having group meetings, having team meetings, and having annual state of the lab meetings are really important too because you can hear everybody's uh, goals and aspirations for the year ahead. Of course, that is a little bit prescriptive and sometimes you need to generate also ad hoc meetings, for example, when scholarships are coming up or papers are being written and that sort of thing. And so you obviously have to have room for additional meetings as well. I have a lot to say about fostering an inclusive work environment. Um, these are some key points, but I think uh, we can talk about that more afterwards when we're having our discussion. But I think one of the things that coming back from my own challenges that I had at the beginning, not knowing what I didn't know, not understanding bureaucratic processes, I've come to realize that that kind of lack of information or lack of transparent information is a barrier to success for a lot of people. If you don't know the rules, how are you to play the game? So I think having very clear um, onboarding and operating procedures, being transparent about how processes work, um, you know, what are committee meetings, et cetera, for your students, really working together with them to come up with their training plans, and importantly, paying attention to when students or trainees are, are maybe not making the progress that you 
are expecting them to make so that you can kind of try to understand what are the barriers to allowing you to move forward. And then usually that means that you can um, come up with some you know, solution. I'm giving you a very one, just a quick example of how we foster transparency in our lab. We have a lab wiki uh, that has developed a, a lot over the years. So this took a long time to build up, but now it's in a good place where we have shared documents for the whole lab that include things like all proposals and scholarships that we've ever written, all theses and committee reports that we have, um, other things like conference notes. Um, papers was a, a new one that we generated a couple of years ago because new students, like master's students, for example, or even PhDs and postdocs, if they're moving from a different field, um, these are papers that are organized based on topic that is like a starting point for students to get into the topic. You, you might expect that students should be able to find those things themselves, but it's kind of useful if you give them, these are some great reviews. These are some really critical uh, starting point pro primary research articles that you should take a look at. And then of course, we also have all of the lab protocols and all SOPs are available too. And all of these documents are living so they can be changed um, as you know, students can edit them. We also have um, a whole section of our wiki that is all about information that you need to know. So for example, all the onboarding procedures, expectations, information about safety training and all that kind of stuff is here. We also have information about waste disposal and lab life section and that sort of thing. We have very clear rules for data management um, and also guidance for writing and presentations that I know that lots of the people in my lab really appreciate the lab wiki. And so it's something I think um, would benefit a lot of junior group leaders as well. We also have a lab calendar that allows us to um, celebrate the diversity of our lab. So for example, here are just some recent ones that I grabbed from the calendar where we were celebrating some various cultural holidays and new this year is that we started adding a little info uh, links so that people can learn also about these um, various traditions and kind of cultures. Okay, so that brings me to my last point, uh, which is about leadership and management. So um, we can talk about leadership a little bit um, in the discussion, just taking a look at the time. But I think I want to differentiate the difference uh, to, between what a leader and a manager are. A uh, leader is somebody who really like acts like a coach, gets to know you as genuine, really cares about your development as, as, a, as a person. And you can learn a lot of these things like um, Thomas was saying through various uh, workshops. When I was an EMBO fellow, I had the chance to take the lab leadership course for postdocs. And this was really, really um, informative and transformative for me. Um, that's a very expensive course if you don't have access to it. There are a lot of free options. I'm sure you can find some through your own universities. If you're in Canada, there is a great MyTax training uh, program that you can take that is also offered for free. And I'm sure that they exist in these similar types of training exist in other um, countries as well. The most important thing that you learn from these types of courses is your emotional intelligence, which will allow you to work with people. And if you're running a research lab, you are working with people. So I think it's definitely worth to invest in that skill set so that you can work well with people. And I'm differentiating this from management because I really feel like management, uh, the, the types of tasks that I list here that I'm not going to go in detail over, but these are really um, tasks. They're important parts of your job. You have to do all of those things, um, but they are really allowing you to kind of manage workflows, manage time, and that sort of thing. Whereas leadership is really about, you know, building the next generation of trainees, uh, developing their, their critical thinking skills and their careers as well. Um, and that brings me to my very last point, which is how do we manage to do all of these things? We're doing research. We haven't even talked about research in this webinar yet, uh, but we do research as well. Um, we have to manage, we have to lead, we have to mentor in all of those different aspects. Um, so my key takeaways for how to have a strong work-life balance is to find a time management strategy that works for you. There's lots of different research on this, lots of different strategies. Uh, you can find one that works. And importantly, learn how to prioritize tasks based on your values that will help you be able to say yes and no strategically so that you can maintain a healthy um, workload. A lot of the ideas that I've just talked about here um, were elaborated in a paper that I wrote recently with a fantastic group of peer mentors. 
which is something I'm going to echo from what Thomas was saying. Finding a peer group is really, really important. Um, I worked with these excellent uh, co-authors um, coming up with lots of ideas that we had over the past few years about how to build a sustainable and reproducible research career. And so I encourage you to take a look at that um, article. Thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to our discussions afterwards. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was a lot of nice tips. That was and, uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Sophia Ashad. Ashad. Dr. Ashad is currently leading the Breathing Night of Science Neurosciences Laboratory at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, India, where they focus in understanding signal processing mechanisms in the brain that enable the expression of breathing patterns in mammals. Well, we invite uh, Sophia to share the screen. Okay. Um, thank you, Regina and Dick Branch, for this opportunity. And I'm excited to be uh, uh, interacting with the ELIF community. Uh, so I'm going to talk about several points uh, which have been highlighted already by uh, Jacqueline and Thomas, uh, but with a slightly different perspective. Uh, so I'll give you an outline of my academic journey. And, and during that journey, what I learned from my mentors and what I learned from my mentees uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, developing mentorship skills and mentor-mentor relationship. Uh, I started uh, my research journey at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, where I was an integrated MS PhD student from 2009 to 16. Uh, and I, uh, for most of my research, uh, I worked with uh, Professor Rishikesh Narayanan and I worked on cellular neurophysiology and trying to understand neuro neuron astrocyte interactions. Uh, from there, I shifted my field and went to understand how network of neurons generate behavior uh, at UCLA in Professor Jack Feldman's lab. And the behavior that I was interested in was breathing rhythms and neural control of breathing. Um, and I completed my postdoctoral research in 2022. And from November 2022 uh, uh, till date, I am uh, assistant professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore. And uh, in terms of what I learned in, uh, about mentorships, uh, I'd like you to take, uh, to take you through my personal journey and the lessons uh, that I learned there. So uh, as, a, as a mentee, the first lesson to be successful and uh, to be able to stand on my own science and my own research was to ask my own independent question. So when I joined my PhD lab, my PhD mentor was very specific about encouraging asking independent questions uh, for each and every student in the lab. Uh, this also meant that there, are, there were really a, any conflicts in terms of research uh, topics between students and everyone was uh, encouraged uh, to explore their creative side. And uh, my training, what other, emphasis during my training was to develop a diverse and interdisciplinary uh, research. Uh, and that was something that motivated me to shift my uh, model system and specific research questions during my postdoctoral research. Uh, during my postdoc, I was also encouraged to focus on emergent research directions uh, that uh, so that I can take the field forward. So this was a great contribution of my postdoc mentor that he encouraged me to ask tough questions, questions where I, and always uh, uh, encouraged me to go beyond my comfort zone. And uh, a good mentor is a mentor who can actually understand what your strengths are, even when you don't understand your own strengths. So, so as Thomas says, understand yourself. A good mentor helps you understand yourself, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, research management as well as in terms of uh, science. Uh, and then understand your research field. Uh, so during my postdoc, uh, towards the end of my postdoctoral training, 
a lot of my mentorship that I received was on uh, focusing on emergent questions and trying to understand the field, getting a broad perspective from a PI who is very senior. So you get a historical perspective of the field, where it was and where it is going, um, and lots of discussions on that. Um, and then I also got opportunity to develop mentorship skills. Uh, the few ways that I developed this was one, actually mentoring trainees in the lab, um, mentoring also undergoing collaborations and then mentoring the PhD students uh, during the collaborations. So we would uh, do interdisciplinary collaborations. If I'm working on, if I'm a neurophysiologist, we collaborated with physicists and, and working uh, on modeling and theoretical, uh, you know, uh, neuroscience projects. And, and there the interactions and mentoring PhD students about neuroscience uh, actually helped me understand uh, much better how to teach and how to uh, teach neuroscience to people who have not been exposed to it, but they are great scientists, um, they are great researchers. Uh, uh, and also mentoring students so I was also part of an education leadership program at UCLA, which is specifically designed for postdocs, uh, where we get an opportunity to interact uh, and we journal clubs with uh, graduate students. Uh, that also helped. Uh, and these were the tools that I used to develop mentorship skills, which would be handy later on during my career. And Professional networking and outreach is, uh, as it has been highlighted, it's very important. Uh, networking among the peers is easy, but networking with established scientists when you are at an early career, uh, that can be a daunting task sometimes. Uh, uh, so I got a lot of help from my postdoc mentor in connecting to people, reaching out to them, and discussing science um, at length, and getting their feedbacks about uh, what I think is correct or not. Um, and this is also important when you are applying for an independent fellowship so that they can evaluate you as a person, your science, and they can write letters for you. Um, and here, uh, again, a mentorship was very important for me. Uh, so when I started my lab, uh, so in India, we have a student-centric research group. Uh, uh, there are very few postdocs uh, uh, that are available in the lab uh, at any time, and especially for the early careers, most of the time it's a research group that is composed of uh, graduate students and MS thesis students. Uh, so that meant that uh, defining my research program, I had to take into account uh, what I can achieve by training. So, so one of the important lessons that I learned early on is to actively define your core research group. Uh, so, uh, so down the lane in next, you know, uh, three, four years, what I would like to uh, uh, develop is uh, a core research direction in which my lab moves. And that requires a delicate balance between collaborative and individual research. And while developing this core research, it is important to develop lab capacity because we can't hire trained personnel. So training is an important part of developing a research program uh, for uh, academic landscape like in India. Uh, and for that, uh, during my PhD training itself, what I learned from my PhD mentors that there are two types of uh, there are two types of research strategies. Uh, there is a strategy in which research output is a byproduct of a good training, and there is a research strategy where training is a byproduct of research. And uh, so I followed based on my mentorships that I received to have a lab group that is training centric, where I work very closely with my PhD students to train them. Uh, we talk at length about what courses to take. I encourage them to ask them their own questions, uh, develop their own skill set. That requires a lot of, uh, that requires, uh, you know, 
a lot of patience in the sense that uh, you have to you you can't have expectations that they will be productive very soon but and in that sense it also requires you to evaluate their progress by a different metric rather than research productivity and that requires very close interactions with the student in terms of teaching and where transparency is very uh, very important if uh, if the students are not transparent uh, if they feel intimidated they may not approach the pi with their problems they may think that my problems are too small to discuss and they may take longer to troubleshoot them um, so in my lab i encourage discussions about failures and challenges there's no panel uh, and every lab meeting um, i make i um, you know i try to implicate this uh, uh, value that lab meeting is not only about results it's about what you did and how you did just go through the process and uh, that helps troubleshoot uh, the problem better that also gives a lot of confidence to mentees uh, that they are heard they're appreciated and they are not judged uh, when things don't work and um, and keeps them motivated it's also important to have a good mental health balance in the lab and uh, have pep talks about mental health issues uh, encourage the students for extracurricular activities um, um, so that when they are going through tough times, uh, they are not really, um, they don't really go to a stage where it's very hard for them. Um, I, I also try to include, I uh, implicate diversity across um, different personalities as well as different disciplines, sub disciplines, as neuroscience is very interdisciplinary. Some of the students who come are very good at uh, computational aspects or mathematics other students are from more biologically oriented backgrounds um, and the idea is to uh, have a synergistic lab atmosphere where they learn from each other people who don't uh, who know little biology learn biology from other people and uh, and vice versa and this promotes interactions among lab members are uh, healthy interactions and where they um, they can troubleshoot for each other. They are available uh, for each other uh, apart from me. Uh, and there's no competition in the lab in that matter. Uh, so these are the lessons that I have learned so far during my mentorship. Uh, I think that uh, as Jacqueline also mentioned, uh, a perspective that I have towards my research goals and career objective is to think of research as a nonlinear dynamics in the sense that for some time you will have a lag phase where not much happens and then you will once you have developed a robust lab capacity and training then the research output will uh, uh, will basically come out a lot of research output will come out in a in a relatively smaller time um, so that's one way of thinking about it that it's not a linear progression uh, when we start research that is training based and when you have to build lab capacity from scratch um, uh, towards a goal. Uh, with that, I would thank you um, again for this opportunity and also I would love to uh, take questions. Thank you, thank you. It's very interesting. And we have a question from the audience, I think addressed to uh, all the panelists, is how do we approach a potential senior senior mentor. I think uh, Thomas, do you talk about uh, a little bit about having senior mentors? So, so I guess it depends a lot on on what type of interaction you have with this person already. So, uh, I think easiest is if this is a senior person in your direct environment that you meet, like in seminars in the same institutes and so on. And then I would just approach them, you know, like whatever occasion, either personally or write them an email, and then. In my experience, I think senior people are very happy to to have a chat and uh, or coffee with you if if you just ask them for advice. Um, so I would just be very blunt and and approach them directly. Yeah. I'm just going to add a small point to that. Uh, one thing I think that uh, supervisors can do 
is make sure when you're at conferences or even when you're not at conferences, just in general, when you're interacting with your trainees, to be proactive in introducing them to your colleagues. Uh, that will also train them to not be frightened <laughs> to interact with senior people. So the more that you can do that, even if that's not the person that they might you know, end up going to work in a lab with, they will have the experience of, of doing that. So take the opportunities when you're at conferences with people, you know, don't be the lone wolf, take your trainees with you and start introducing them to your network. Great, bye. And there's a question to Jacqueline from Charles David Yeet. How easy is to truly say no when you have too much on your plate? Oh, no, so I didn't say it's easy. <laughs> yeah, it's so not easy. easy. It's not easy. But I think, um, you know, one of the things I learned from uh, the wonderful Liz Haswell when we worked together on that, um, on that paper that I talked about at the end um, is that it's really important to define your value system. When, that can change over time. So you have to kind of go back to it each year um, or at an interval that makes sense. And if you can clearly define your values um, in terms of your, your work and your life and so on, then you can orient your goals and your tasks uh, with your values. And knowing that is a very powerful way of knowing what you can say yes and no to. It makes decisions a lot easier. It makes harder decisions a lot easier. Um, and one thing I've heard somewhere on Twitter, I hope, I don't remember who said it, but somebody said that saying no um, to something means that you can say yes to things you've already committed to um, or saying yes to things that might be more important to you. So it's not easy. It takes time. It just, it takes time. Eventually, though, if you're committed to learning how to be strategic about those things, it will become a lot easier to say no to even even great opportunities. But if they don't align right now, say no, you have you're only one person. You can't do everything. You have to basically save yourself. Sometimes you can say, OK, no, not right now, but please keep me in mind in, in two years time or something like that. There's an, another question from Paul Millington. Have you participated in formal university mentoring schemes? Have you, I mean, how have you benefited from this? I think Sophia, you talk a little bit about you know, this type of programs in university. Yeah, so I did um, uh, participate in one of these programs, which was specifically designed for postdocs. And this was uh, for UCLA uh, bioscience uh, uh, postdoc education leadership programs where uh, we participated in graduate student. Uh, so there was this course where uh, we would sit through the lectures uh, uh, with the PIs, and then there would be, uh, and, and there were several modules, and for each module, there would be a journal club. Uh, and uh, the postdocs would actually interact with the students for journal club. There would be assignments that we would discuss, and there would be papers that we would discuss, and we would try to highlight how to uh, what nuances to look into those papers and uh, and any specific questions that arise from there so that was kind of teaching leadership program uh, uh, that was useful uh, to some extent in the sense that it there are certain latent uh, you know uh, latent skills that we learn it just brings them out and helps refine them much better uh, in a more formal setup. Um, and that's the utility of it. Okay. That's an interesting question from Thomas Cook. How do you address conflicts within your group? How to balance your own interests in some goals versus the interests of your group members? Anybody? <laughs> Maybe you don't have conflicts in your groups. <laughs> no, no, conflicts every day. <laughs> I mean, I think it, this, it, it, it's a really good question. It's something I ask interviewees all the time, like give me an example of how you handle the conflict. And sometimes people say, no, I don't get into conflicts. And this, we're human. There are conflicts all the time. So I think uh, even in the most inclusive spaces, you're going to have even small conflicts. One of the things I think it's really important to recognize is that research environments are inherently stressful. Um, even if we try for them not to be, as I said, a lot of people tie their self-worth into their work, and that is going to 
breed pressure and stress and so on. So I think finding ways to release that pressure is really important. Uh, for example, one thing that we do in lab meeting is we spend 15 minutes playing Uno. It's a silly thing, but it kind of, uh, you know, lightens the mood and it's kind of fun. Um, when when real conflicts arise, though, like ones that are not just kind of petty things, um, you have to be willing to have difficult conversations with your team or with individual people who are um, who are suffering with that conflict. So you have to pay attention. There's no like one answer to how to handle conflicts because they're so different. But I think overall having a willingness to not let it fester and really try to come up like to facilitate a resolution as soon as possible um, is the, the best way to do it. So the different skills, there's all sorts of different ways depending on what type of conflict. So, but generally just not letting it sit is an important thing. Yeah. Communication is the key. Uh, we have another question from Mahiba um, and then to Slavo. We all have different personalities. As group leader, how do you manage group dynamics to ensure to ensure the well integration of each personality within the group and to make sure everyone finds their place? So one one of the approach that I have is that I assume that everyone will be different. So there is no homogeneous structure that I follow. Uh, uh, there are people who are more individualistic and um, and I think that's okay if they want totally independent research. Uh, there are people who are more collaborative um, and and that's also okay. Uh, and in terms of, uh, I have students who, who love more frequent interactions I have students who uh, who don't really want to very many frequent interactions, uh, but they are uh, you know very diligent in their work uh, because I think that uh, one of the you know my understanding is that they have a very high bar for themselves, so they think that if they have done something significant only then they uh, come to me, or if there is any other problem. Um, so there are also subtle ways of engaging with your research group. Um, uh, for example, we go for lab tea or coffee or lab lunch um, together. Um, and it's not mandatory that everyone comes, uh, uh, but whoever wants to join, um, they are welcome. And we talk about different topics. It helps in easing scenarios and and people with different, uh, ultimately what happens is that people with different personalities start interacting in a much better way because there is no interaction over work. It's just socializing. Uh, but there is a general theme of being in the lab uh, and having some sense of uh, similarity in that sense. Uh, so that helps. but. Uh, but my way of dealing with different personalities is that uh, I accept it that people are different and they will have different um, different level of interactions and different uh, way of communicating and that's okay. Um, I sh as a PI should be accommodated to that. Thank you, sir. And there's a question for, um, for, from Shantan and Basu. I'm a perfectionist by nature, and sometimes I feel I'm too harsh with my students. But I also, uh, but it's also my value system. How to deal with this dichotomy? Uh, I'm happy to. I have an answer for this one or a suggestion, anyway, because I also identify as a perfectionist. So this is something I've also had to learn. So I think one thing that's um, interesting in the way you phrase it is that it's part of your value system. Um, it's not necessarily part of your trainee's value system. It might be, but it's worth having a discussion about that. I think generally speaking, if we are perfectionists, we have high expectations of ourselves and high expectations of others. So I think if we have high expectations of our trainees, um, we have to match it with high levels of support. So if the students um, are struggling or they need help in order to, I don't know, do the, whatever it is that you're you know, hoping that they will excel at, then it's our job to train them how to do that. 
So something to consider. <laughs> it's not an easy answer, though. Uh, I understand your struggle because I also struggle with that. <laughs> So just maybe to add on here, so I think it helps to communicate also that this is really something important for you, um, so they better understand also why your standards might be so high or, you know, what is your motivation behind, uh, like, uh, asking them to repeat experiments or uh, just having a certain way of, of doing tasks. So I think an open communication there is also very, very important. Mm -hmm. There's another question from Richard Lenny. And say thank you. What type of support do you expect uh, to obtain from department faculty and uh, leadership as ECR and for time protection, teaching relief, etc.? I, I think it, like institutional level of support to ECR. So maybe I can briefly answer there. So I guess that. It really varies between the institute and, and the department or university you are at. So I think I was lucky during my postdoc that uh, there was some institutional program that was supporting leadership courses. Um, I think Jacqueline mentioned the MBO leadership program. So um, this really is uh, like, it depends a lot where you are. Uh, but I think there are also good online courses or, or resources that you can try to access and and then I would just discuss it with my PI as well uh, to make sure that he understands that you want to take time in developing these skills. And I'm, I'm sure he will appreciate that that this is something that is important for you and, and is part of your training as well. I think a little bit related to this, and there's a question from Eden Lopez. Do you have recommendations to support students struggling with mental health? And I think that um, it's a really important topic. Uh, uh, it's uh, in several ways. Uh, it affects uh, the research group. It affects students. Uh, so one of the things that uh, as a group leaders, we can do very proactively to talk about it in the lab and lab meetings and to make it clear that it's okay to discuss these things. These are not taboo uh, and that you understand and that it's uh, um, just like any other illness when people need time to recover, it's okay to take time uh, for mental illness also. Uh, also create a lab atmosphere which is very um, inclusive and understanding. It doesn't mean, so there is a balance here between, you know, uh, privacy as well as uh, keeping a very warm lab atmosphere which is accommodating so it's not necessarily that uh, you know you, you you discuss who is suffering from what but as a general discussion in the lab um, as for individual discussions uh, uh, we should have uh, access to institutional support system uh, you know, uh, and in nowadays, in uh, almost in all institutes, there are very active support systems available, and we should guide students there, um, and make them feel relaxed and that it's okay to go through a bad phase, and everyone goes through it. Uh, you know, uh, at some point in their life, uh, so, and this is very important. Uh, as a human perspective, also as for, you know, your lab productivity, um, um, to have this, uh, uh, have a very supportive atmosphere in the lab on these issues. It's very important to support the students. And I think we can take one final question. There's one from Virginia Mier. What techniques, approaches do you use to keep your team motivated, especially during areas of high stress or significant challenges? I can offer one thing <laughs> to Virginia. Um, I think one of the first things, I mean, we talk a lot about transparency and communication. I think uh, being open about if it's a time of significant challenge or stress for you um, to mention that 
I think it's it's like it can be useful to either mention it if you're not comfortable with the rest of your group, but even with your group leader, because it helps to, I don't know, redefine some ongoing goals, uh, timelines and things like that. Most of our research is not urgent. Most of our work is not urgent. So even if we're working on revisions and that sort of thing, it's actually not as urgent as most of us think that those things are. So if you, you can talk to your group leader and or talk to your supervisor and see, is it possible to extend this deadline? I can't manage all of these things at the same time. I think not talking about it is probably worse. <laughs> but if if you mean about high significant challenges for the whole team, so if everybody is feeling that stress, um, then and I think there would have to be some different approaches. I think still talking about it is the first step, but then it would really depend on what the challenge is in terms of what kind of strategy you might you might need. It could be something like, let's start having picnic. That could be something simple, but it sounds like you mean something that's a little bit more challenging than that. So I guess you would need to find more information so that you could better um, identify, you know, solutions. Uh, well, we have... Um your time for today and thank you to all the panelists it was a great event and thank you to the people who attended to and participate with their questions if you wish to continue our discussions you can do it and you can contact us at community at the live events and you can tweet using the hashtag tcr webinar and ask the live community so thank you everyone and this session will be on youtube in the next days and then and thank you to the rest of the other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. <laughs>